So I was uh, preparing for the sermon. It was like a couple months back, and I Googled the word snow in the Psalms, and it came up with Psalms 147, but this quickly became, I think it's becoming one of my favorite Psalms. Uh, there are three points in this Psalms where it really touched my heart in a really personal way. Um, and it's like that deep emotional impact. I don't know if you guys felt it before, but it's like God, this Holy Spirit just washing over you and that kind of that kind of resonance in your heart. Uh, one of my audience has described this experience as like a whoosh. So I hope that I can uh, share that with you today. Uh, yeah, let, uh, let's pray again. Yeah, uh, Father God, um, we have your word before us uh, and we ask that you speak to us with your word. Um, we ask that you make your word shine um, and that it may be a light in the darkness that pierces uh, into our souls, that we may experience the impact and the power of your spirit at work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah, so this psalm's uh, a quick overview of the setting is this takes place after the exile. Um, as some of you would know, uh, many of you would know that Israel took a long time to finally get into the promised land, but then they had continued disobedience, and so the Lord sent prophets to warn them. But despite this, they continued to be disobedient, and so the Lord handed them over to the enemies, and they were kicked off the promised land. Uh, so the Israelites were dispersed, they lost their home, and their Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, but later in the 5th century BC, under Persian rule, uh, they were allowed to come back to their land. Uh, so God gathered the dispersed people, and he allowed them to rebuild Jerusalem. And so that's kind of where this whole psalm takes place. Uh, very briefly here, you'll see that the, stand, the psalm splits itself into three stanzas, and each of them are marked with a section of praise, uh, almost like a structural indicator. Uh, yeah, and in each three stanzas, uh, I felt God's word touching my heart. Yeah, so. The first one here is, uh, yeah, stanza one, under the stars. Yeah, so, question for you guys. Who knows your pain best? Um, you might think, is it your friend? Is it your family, your parents, maybe your best friend, uh, or maybe even yourself? Uh, but sometimes that we see that that's actually quite uh, unreliable too. That's why we have things like Freedom Session and, and Journey Home and those things that could help us explore deeper. Uh, or maybe it's your counselor, right? But uh, I guess my case is that the Lord knows us the best, right? If I left that out there, it wouldn't be very convincing. So we'll let the rest of the stanza convince us. We see here that it starts with a section of praise, verse 1. Uh, that's formally outside of the stanza proper, so we're going to zoom in a bit. Here from verse 2 to verse 6 is stanza 1. We see there's an outside section and then the center section. So this uh, is a common poetic device called chiasm. Uh, if you haven't been, uh, haven't been able to attend some of the poetry sessions, uh, yeah, this might be a, a new word for you, but what is a chiasm? It's a really common structure in the Hebrew Bible um, throughout the Old Testament, whether it's poetry or in narratives, it's really everywhere. Uh, and there's always an outside that corresponds, and then there's a center that holds a special significance. Uh, you can see the outside, how it corresponds. You see the word Yahweh, and you have the downcast of Israel being paired with the downtrodden of Israel. Uh, and then there's something in the middle that's really special about stars. You might ask, what is the point of a chiasm? Uh, in English poetry, is really uh, a key feature of English poetry is that there's rhymes and rhythms and stuff like that. But then in Hebrew, it's the main focus is to build connections so that we can think about how those ideas relate. And so here we have on the outside, God taking care of the, Israel pe the people of Israel. And then how does that relate to the middle section about stars? <coughs> uh, 
Uh, one of the things that we lost with our uh, modern society is the view of the stars. Um, I'm not a big camper either, so I never really get to be so far away from the city that there'd be no light pollution. And you can see something like this. Uh, here's a photo by uh, Nathan Anderson. It's a two hour long exposure, so we can actually see the stars. Um, so I have a task for you. <laughs> I want you to count the stars. <laughs> uh, like, because uh, when God told Abraham to count the stars, he really wanted him to give it a try. Um, I, I think uh, we're not, we're not going to spend too much time counting now, but in Sunday school, we're going to come back to this as an exercise. Um, I think one of the challenges is when I try to count the stars, it's really easy to lose track of where I've counted and what I haven't. Um, and I think that's just the limit of the human understanding. And so when God said count the stars, there's a, implied that he can't. Uh, and this photo has, you know, it's just this one square, but imagine if this was a 360 view all around you. Truly impossible to count. And then now, uh, my next question is, is it, which is more difficult, to name this, to count the stars, or to name the stars? So this middle section is split into two halves, um, and they correspond with one another. If we look at the first line, counts the number of stars, that's matched with great as the Lord, numerous in strength. And so there's a sense that as uncountable as the stars are, that's as uncountable God's strength is. When we look at the stars we, and we spend time looking at them, we get a sense of what infinity is. And then we transfer those thoughts back to God and understand that his strength is also infinity, uncountable, beyond our comprehension. It helps that these two lines are rhymed in Hebrew also. The number of stars is mispar kochavim, and numerous in strength is rav koach. And then the second lines, they also correspond. As for all of them, by name he calls, match with his understanding has no number. So there's a sense that if God can name each of the stars, then truly his understanding is infinite. And these two lines are also rhymed in Hebrew. Uh, there's five sounds that are rearranged. Uh, by name he calls, Shmot Yikra, and no number, Ein Mispar. On the outside of this stanza, we see the word number repeated twice, counts the number of the stars, and the last line asks for his understanding has no number. So there's a sense that as infinite as the stars are, that's as infinite as God's attribute is. That is his strength and understanding. So coming back to here, the middle part is about God's infinite strength and understanding. And how does that relate to the outside section? When Israel was cast and exiled out of their home, they lost their community, they lost their land, and perhaps even their sense of identity. It was really a truly heartbreaking time for them. And you could imagine, you know, that having wounds is, is a light way to, to talk about how much suffering and hardship they are going through being, you know, dispersed from their land. But the connection here is that God in his infinite strength and understanding knows the deep hardships of each of those Israelites that were dispersed. And in his infinite strength, he is able to regather his people, rebuild their home in Jerusalem. In his infinite strength, he's able to reach down deep into their broken hearts and heal them and bandage their wounds in a very tenderly and caring way. So here I'm already starting to feel uh, God's the impact of the scripture, but here, here's a Here's the, the true kicker, I think. Genesis 15, 5. <clears throat> and he brought Abraham outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offsprings be. And so stars represent the offspring of Israel. 
if we were uh, a Jewish person reading this, this connection would be quite firm in, our, in their minds. But for us, yeah, we'll keep this connection. Stars represent the offspring of Israel. And so when we go back and read verse 4, the Lord, he counts the number of stars. As for all of them, by name he calls. God knows the name of each offspring of Israel, each one that was exiled, each one that lived in hardship. And God, in his infinite knowledge, knows you personally also. So back to the question. Who knows your pain best? Who heals you the best? None but our Lord. So we go back to verse 1. Praise Yah, for it is good to sing to our God. It is pleasant and fitting is his praise. You know who else knows our name? John 10, verse 3. The sheep hear the shepherd's voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. Jesus knows your name. So when you are hurting, who should you turn to? When your wounds are deep and your heart is broken and shattered in pieces, who should you turn to? Jesus knows your name, and Jesus has the power to heal. So stanza two, <coughs> baby birds. This section also has a uh, praise that's kind of outside of the stanza proper. Uh, so this section really only has two, uh, two parts. Uh, the first part, the first half, God provides for his creation. He starts by covering the sky with dark clouds. These clouds produce rain. Rain produces grass. Grass produces food for the animals. And then this section closes on a very specific and peculiar image to the young crows who call out. In the next section, it says, uh, not in the might of horse he delights, not in the legs of the man he desires. Desires, O Yahweh, those who fear him, those who wait for his loyal love. And so in the first section, God provides, but in the second section, God said he wants us to rely on him. The poetic impact of this stanza really comes from three important comparisons. First one is between a crow and a man. Without going into too much detail, both the rhyme schemes and the sentence grammatical structure support that the last, the way the two ending, the way the two sections end are connected. And so verse nine gives food to the young crows who call out is matched with verse 11, those who wait for his loyal love. So crow is being compared with man. The next comparison is a horse and a man. This one should be apparent that they are placed immediately uh, in parallel. <clears throat> and then the third thing that's compared here is the crow and the horse. Um, they are also parallel lines and immediately juxtaposing each other. So I don't have much experience with horses. This is me, I think 10 years ago, I'm in the middle. And then my parents are, yeah, we're, this is our, our chance to ride a horse, and they walked really slowly for us. Uh, so when the passage said, the might of a horse, uh, what does that mean? We're going to have to rely on a video. first one oh. Watching the video, I keep thinking, like, that's really impressive. I, I just think I've never seen a horse sprint before. And even while it's sprinting, it doesn't look like it's working that hard, to be honest. Uh, 
when I looked, uh, when I Googled, what is the max speed of a horse? Uh, so the Guinness Book of Records, uh, 88 kilometers per hour. And by comparison, humans sprinting is actually 44 kilometers, exactly half. Okay, so very impressive horse there. Uh, and then what, what is a baby crow like? So here we have a video also. If we were reading this with, uh, as a Jewish person, there's another layer of meaning that's really important here. As you know, the, the Jewish people, they, uh, they were given food laws and they take it very seriously. Um, Leviticus 11, 13 to 15. These you are to detest among the birds. They must not be eaten because they are detestable. The griffin vulture, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the buzzard of any kind, and every kind of crow. So the young crow here is not only small and helpless, but even unclean and detestable. And if the man is like a young bird, perhaps that's how Paul is when he looks at his sin. In Romans seven eighteen, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. But yet this psalm compares man to a baby bird. <clears throat> Have you guys taken an uh, animal personality test before? There's like four animals. There's the lion, the bold leader, the otter, the playful and energetic one, and uh, the golden retriever that's loyal and relational. It's a good people person. And then there's beavers that are really reserved and analytical. I think I'm probably a beaver. Uh, the poetic impact here is that we are all helpless young crows. While the horse is racing at 88 kilometers per hour, we have no wings to fly, no ability to find food. The only thing that bird can do is really wait in a nest, wait for food to be provided. See how their mouths open towards the heavens. That was the posture for Israel when they were oppressed and broken and dispersed from their homeland. And knowing that only God could restore and heal them. And that should be our posture when we pray, waiting, hungry, and yearning for God's love to rain down from heaven. When we imagine ourselves to be like these baby birds, we learn to be completely dependent on God. Before we go to the next stanza, there's one more uh, really cool wordplay that I want to share. The word here for young crow, in Hebrew it actually says sons of crows, uh, bnei orev. Um, this is a really, there's only one occurrence of this, um, these two words being put together this way. And if you were reading this in Hebrew uh, quickly, you might accidentally read sons of Jacob and you can see how the letters are really similar. So <clears throat> verse nine might read as God gives food to the sons of Jacob who call out. Right. So stanza three, in the snow. There's a slide change error. Ah, 
Okay, good. So we talked about how the Israelites were dispersed and then regathered. Jerusalem was destroyed and rebuilt. This was very well described in stanza one. But stanza three here actually talks about the blessings that God continues to give them after. This stanza also has three parts, and it's also arranged as a chiasm. So there are outside parts that talk about blessing. Uh, it talks about God blessing them with strong gates, giving them peace and grains. And then in the bottom section, it talks about God blessing them with his word, his scripture, his laws and decrees. And then in the middle, we have something very peculiar, the word being compared with snow. Uh, verse 17. In verse 17, the word becomes dangerously cold, uh, says, before his chill, who can stand? Um, but then in verse 18, it warms up and the ice becomes water. So I had to ask, like, uh, does it snow in Israel? Um, so this is a photo from January of this year, and apparently they do snow even in Jerusalem. Uh, quite infrequent, maybe every five years, and I've confirmed with my, my Israeli friends that in northern Israel, it might snow even every year. What are our thoughts on snow? Uh, what comes to mind? We have a Christmas song called Winter Wonderland, <laughs> and even this morning, I heard some of you guys say like, oh, it's so beautiful. Um, and I think the, the psalmist like, agrees. Like in verse 16, it says snow is like wool. Right, something like really fluffy and beautiful coming out of the air. But then later, the wool turns into ash, and then ash escalates into ice shards and becomes dangerous and harsh. Yeah, so this psalms is uh, this stanza. Um, it's really driven by a series of comparisons. We can have the next slide. <coughs> um, so we talked about how Israel was in their disobedience. The prophets, they prophesied judgment. But with their prophecy, they always come with a promises of healing that come after. In verse 15, it says, till full speed he runs his word. Uh, and that is referring to God's prophecy. So the judgment is being compared with a hailstorm. But then when it melts in verse 18, it's as if the judgment is over. The ice is thawed, flowing water can give healing and life again. Uh, but then in verse 19, it immediately brings up the word, word again, as if this is the same word. But instead of prophecy, the word takes the form of law and decrees. So the lesson here is when we look at the powerful cold, we understand the power, the power of the word of prophecy. And then when we understand that, we understand God's word, its power in other forms as well. So there's a beautiful <coughs> uh, poetic device here. Uh, and that there's a word play. Uh, so we see here the, the, the lettering for speech looks like that. Uh, and then wool is spelled very similarly. Like there's one letter difference. And then the word for ash also looks really similar. So it's as if the word for speech is transforming into the resemblance of snow. Okay. And the next here we have uh, the sound plays. Okay, so verse 16 and 17, there's full of the K, F, and R sound. If you can imagine the F sound just being something like wind, and then the sound of K as if the hail shards are hitting the roof the ground, the trees, making the k sound, and the r as of the howling sound of the wind. That's right. So I'm going to read this in Hebrew. The frost like ash he scatters, kafor kafer yefazer, and he hurls his ice like shards, mashlik karcho kafitim. It's as if the actual words of God are coming to life out of the page and transforming into palpable snow and hail.
Siberia might be a byword for freezing. But today, it's a sweaty 41 degrees Celsius, and families are out on the beach. wall of cold Arctic air came down. What feelings came to mind as you watched the video? I thought it was very, very scary. Uh, at some point, it went from lighthearted to progressively more and more serious. And I was really worried about the people, um, especially when I saw the hail hit the ocean and the, the amplitude of that splashing. I think that's the same fear that Israel felt when they were invaded by their enemies and they realized that God's word of prophecy was coming true. Verse 15, it says, till full speed he runs his word. God's prophecy always comes true. You can't outrun it, even if you were a horse, like in stanza two. That's what makes it powerful. And in verse 17, before his chill, who can stand? Truly, who can stand before God's powerful word? <clears throat> when we think of God's word, what comes to mind? Is it precious, mundane? Is it dead or irrelevant or alive and powerful? Is God's word a blessing? Does God's word give abundance of life? Here, verse 20, it says, He has not done this with any other nation. His decrees, they do not know them. So we see that the psalmist considers it such a privilege to receive God's word. In Bible times, only Israel was blessed with God's word. And even today, not everyone has received God's word yet. So what a privilege that we have, uh, that we could be adopted in God's family and be blessed with it. When we meditate on the power of the hailstorm, we get a glimpse of the power of God's word in both the Old and New Covenant, whether God's word takes the form of prophecy, law, narratives, stories, or instructions. <clears throat> so God's word is part of his special care for both Israel in the past and us today. God's word, when as law, has the power to bless Israel with peace, social order, and right relationship with God and right relationship with the people in their life. So is God's word a blessing in your life today? Um, I know this passage has been a blessing in my life. In stanza one, it gave me a glimpse of God's infinite strength and understanding so that I can also understand how capable he is to intimately care for me. And in stanza two, um, the image of the young crow, I found it really helped my prayer life, that whenever I pray, I could imagine myself as a young crow, and that helps me to understand my desperate condition and to deeply rely on God. 
And in stanza three, when I, when I saw the video of the hailstorm and understood, and my heart was shaken, I understood a glimpse of how powerful God's word is. So here I've given, uh, I've written step-by-step -step instructions uh, of how to, I guess, apply these imageries into your life. So stanza one, yeah, we're invited to look at the stars for a sense of infinity. Um, today it's really hard to do that, but the Bible actually gives us another alternative, uh, and that is to count the grains of sand. So we'll be doing that later today uh, in Sunday school. And then we transfer those thoughts of the sense of infinity to understand God's infinite strength and understanding. And that should motivate us to pray because no one knows and heals you better. No one but our infinite God. And stanza two, baby bird, imagine yourself as a crow waiting and calling out to its heaven to rain down provisions. This imagery and helps us to know that all our provisions come from heaven, from God. So let this imagery powerfully bless your prayer life. And then stanza three, the snow. Uh, recall the hailstorm and learn how powerful God's word is. When we see how powerful God's word is, we can, that helps us to consider it precious, which motivates us to read it and let it powerfully bless our lives. Before we conclude, uh, another observation, you've seen this slide before, uh, the layout of the entire Psalms. Notice that stanza one and stanza three is, uh, they perfectly relate to each other. And this whole Psalms is a chiasm. So on the green parts, it talks about God taking care of Israel. And then the blue part, we have an observation of nature that helps the psalmist understand God's power. But there's actually a very key difference between these two. In stanza one, it's coming from a perspective of Israel and in their brokenness, they reflect and remember God's power to heal. But in stanza three, it's actually the complete opposite. <clears throat> People are blessed but then in the middle, they look at the snow and remember God's power to judge. So how do these connect to the middle, the stanza two? The key of this entire Psalms is that when you are broken, don't forget to humbly rely on God. And when you are blessed, also don't forget to humbly rely on God. Okay, so let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for Psalms 147. You've given, much, uh, you've given us much beautiful imagery that can bless our lives. Truly, we are like the young baby crow. We are desperate in our condition, and we fully know that we need to rely on you for, for all our provisions, our day-to-day -day provisions, and all our special provisions. Uh, needs for provisions also. And we know that you, Lord, are infinite in your strength and understanding that only know, only you know us so personally and you know our pain more than anyone. So we come to you and we want to rely on you. Yeah, thank you for your work in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray.